Mr. Phil McCoy is uh, via telephone. Philip, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well. I, I'm, I confess to starting to get a little bit hungry. <laughs> Norm, d- during my break, <laughs> I was either waking up at this time or eating at this time. Well, it, it's a little bit later than your normal normal hunger hunger pain. <laughs> so the body's adjusting. Yeah. Phil, Phil, while we were away, the Pittsburgh Steelers rediscovered how to play offense in the NFL. Yes, they did. And and I wonder if us talking about them constantly was the problem. I don't know. The, I mean, the the only difference is Mason Rudolph in for Mitch Trubisky, who was in for Kenny Pickett. And I, I, have, I still have a hard time, even though it looks like the proof is in the pudding, but I have a hard time just believing that a backup quarterback, you know, second or third string, whatever, would make that big of a difference. But, man, the last two weeks, they put up crazy offensive numbers, and I don't know how it compares to the rest of the league because I'm not used to them scoring 30 points and getting 450 yards and not having more three and outs than they do first downs. I'm not used to that, so I don't really know what the norm is. But, man, I, I certainly the last two weeks that offense looked good, and it covered up for an ailing defense. I mean, they've got holes all through that defense. They pulled Miles Jack off the street. Now, do you remember him from last year? He was like mm-hmm. a smaller inside linebacker, number 51. He was smallish. He comes back this year, he, he's big and fat. I mean, a guy hadn't done anything for a year, and they pull him off the street, and he's playing. And But that offense, moving the ball, running the ball, getting first downs, apparently it's giving the defense a little bit of a rest, and, and they're holding up. It's been a good two weeks. I mean, it, it's kind of I, – I think we're going to end up being sad because if they win – go 10-7 and seven and don't get into the playoffs, we're going to look back on that three-game stretch and where they lost to New England, uh, Arizona, and then got blown out by the Colts. Had they won any of those, we'd be looking pretty good right now. But it, there's still a better chance than not that they're not going to make the playoff. But having said that, that gives you some discussion heading into next year. Uh, hopefully they hang on to Mason Rudolph. And because he looks like an NFL quarterback, and we hadn't seen that since Big Ben's been there. You watched the uh, semifinal games last night? I did. I did. And I picked the Washington game. I've been telling everybody to, to go with Washington over Texas. So I was, I was proud of that. I really didn't have, uh, I didn't have a prediction, per se, for Alabama, Michigan. I figured it would be a good game, but there were two good games, uh, two really good games. And I, I'm I'm excited for next week. It's a different national championship than what we're used to. There's no SEC team in it. And you've got someone for the very last year that the Pac twelve's in existence, you may have the national champion come out of that conference. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Where's where's Washington going next year? Anybody know? What big conference? ten, I think. Are they in yeah, the big I think ten? Big ten, yeah. Okay. Well, uh Michael Penix had uh, a night last night. I was in bed because that one was way too late for me with this being a work morning here. Matt, you stayed up and watched that one, though. I did, and I was just going to say I was so impressed with him. You know, I, I could see him being the top quarterback taking just the arm strength that he showed, you know, solid accuracy, um, you know, tough, uh, big kid. I mean, I, I was very impressed with the way that he ran that Washington offense. I think they said he had the second most passing yards in an FBS uh, uh playoff game yeah it was up around 430 something um right right near the end of the game so yeah that played well now i I missed the the grand finish um i i went and met with some friends at at a friend's house and we were watching and of course it's one o'clock in the morning and and you're down to that final minute and i'm watching uh texas burn their final time out and washington's going to run another play what maybe take a knee it's over so uh, uh, a couple of us were like hey we're going to get an early start headed home and then i get home I, I didn't pull it up of course couldn't find it on the radio anyway so i'm not listening in any way thinking it's over and i get home and i pull my phone out and i'm setting my alarm and my buddy josh who hosted us is like you guys missed the ending yeah. and then i go back and read and find out more about how it played out with an injury and then that stops the clock and you've got a punt and texas had to throw in the end zone for the final play of the game that almost gave him a comeback win so it was crazy you go to a friend's house spend three hours watching a game yep. on a school night as it were and you leave with one minute left 
Hey, not the not the fourth quarter. Well, but one it's, minute left. It, it's the idea, and that's the things that I read this morning, just briefly. You know, were so many question marks of play calling and decision making that you know you you had a chance to run the clock out a little bit and do a better job. Anyway. It, yeah, I did. I, I thought it was over. I figured it's done. The Michigan game with Alabama was uh, classic. It was one of the best Rose Bowl games I've seen since Vince Young in Texas against yeah. Matt Leinert, Reggie Bush in USC, which was probably the greatest college football game I've seen in the last yeah. 30 years. Uh, but uh, that was a great one yesterday. There was a wonderful article on Nick Saban. I think it was on ESPN.com. And his upbringing, in, and he went to Monanga, the, the now defunct Monanga, high school where in I think it was 68 his team won the state football championship uh, he was also on the baseball team I think in the basketball team as well and his his teammates they found I think nine former teammates on that team that talked about Nick Saban and his attention to detail mm. and how uh they how tough their practices were they had two or three hours of solid uh, what we, which is what we did in the day just solid contact for two hours on a crappy field and everybody my age probably and maybe from Phil's age on up understands those days. And then afterward, he would then lead his team in drills afterward. He didn't tell them to stay, but he would stay and do things. And because he was staying, his teammates would stay. Mm-hmm. And, and that was Nick Saban. And they, none of them were surprised by his ability to achieve great things as a, mm-hmm. as a football coach. But that was a heck of a game. And I'm looking forward to next week's game because I don't know who would win. I mean, that Michigan-Washington right. is a pretty good matchup. Whereas before, if there was an SEC team in, SEC team in there against anybody else, like, oh, the SEC team's going to win. This is different. Could, have you – do you get baffled, I guess, is the way I'm trying to I'm trying to think about the question. That Michigan offense in the second half did not do squat. Until. Until, yeah. yeah. And then it's like, okay, this is the most important drive of the game, and suddenly they make plays – and and that that defense for Alabama could not make plays that that they had been making through the third quarter and over half of the fourth quarter. It's just amazing to me how a game plays like that. Phil, can you explain that as an offensive lineman why you can block somebody with a minute left in the game but you can't with with fifteen minutes in the game? No, I guess I guess it's maybe a sense of urgency that every, everyone feels, and probably from a play calling standpoint, when the game's on the line, you're more aggressive. I guess, but that game, you're right, that game went back and forth where I thought in the first half Michigan outplayed. Alabama was fortunate only to be down 13-10. to 10. So I thought, man, Michigan has really outplayed them. Very lucky that it's just 13-10. to 10. And then the second half, I thought the exact opposite, where Alabama had played, outplayed Michigan, and Michigan was lucky to be in the game. But I, I was surprised with, you know, in overtime, two runs, they just went gangbusters. Like, they, they had everything blocked up. And then Alabama, of course, they had a difficult time moving the ball and, and couldn't get in. But it, it, it was a really good game. I didn't really have a rooting interest, I guess. If I had to pick someone, I for some reason, I've always liked Nick Saban. I guess he's from West Virginia. But um, I, I guess if I had to pick, I would have said Alabama. But it's good to see Michigan get in. They, they've been on the doorstep for a while and uh, so it was a good performance. I'm excited for next week. Next week's weekend football is packed. I mean, but between the, you know, we, if the Steelers beat the Ravens, that's a big if. If the Steelers beat the Ravens, then we've got two other rooting interests, and I think the last game on the NFL slate is the more important one for the Steelers with Miami and Buffalo. Then you got the national championship coming. It's, a, it's going to be a, a, a fun football week. I'm sure my household's not going to be happy about all the football that we're going to watch. <laughs> if you haven't seen this yet, Blake Corum is the running back for Michigan. He just broke Michigan's all-time rushing touchdowns uh, record for a career. HBO, a few years back, did a series called The Cost of Winning. And this was a documentary on St. Francis Academy in Baltimore where Blake Corum went to school. And it's a great uh, look inside the lives of these high school kids, especially uh, the, the ones who were from uh, the city. And uh, Biff Poggi, who is the head football coach there and now is the head football coach at uh, UNC Charlotte. Uh, it, it's a wonderful look back. You see Blake Corman as a high school football player and uh, a little bit about what he went through in his personal life. Uh, those kind of things always uh, appeal to me. Uh, like the old QB1 shows on, I think it was Netflix, uh, where they track all these yeah. high school quarterbacks. Justin Fields from the Bears was the subject Justin of one Fields of these. Of 
Uh, yep. Jake Fromm was one. Uh, Uwe Alongale, who uh, is uh, he just he's transferring somewhere right. else. It'll be his third college wherever he's going next. I just heard about it this morning. He was in there uh, as well. It's uh, it's fun to look at those things because you see these kids as high school players and they've right. gone on to the NFL and whatever. Phil, let's talk money. It's a new year. What kind let's of year was twenty three for the markets? We had some pretty good gains, I think. Twenty three was great, and for the for a large part of it, it was because of the last quarter of twenty three that was that was so good uh, you know we had the whole year was good but the third quarter kind of drug us back down to earth and the fourth quarter shot us back up and the the narrative will be the same in 24 as it was in 22 as it was in 23 it's going to be the same for 24 those things that we focus on and the data points and the alphabet super reports as bill would put it is, is the most important thing, and, and everything else around that is kind of just noise or does it impact any of these? And this Friday we get a big one right off the bat with the December jobs report. And the jobs report is walking a tightrope for sure because we need to see some softness, but not so much so that it puts recession fears back on the table or makes us start talking about recession yet again. So that's the, the tightrope that the jobs report that we're going to focus on. Last time it came in, I think the unemployment rate was at 3.8, I think, and the new jobs added was a little bit less than what was expected, and that kind of helped fuel the rally or continue the rally that we had in the fourth quarter. But those are the, the combination of things that we need to see is the softness in the overall jobs market, not a complete shutdown, but some softness, especially with wages. We also need to see content inflation continue to track down we may get to a point where deflation is a big concern so we don't want to see any huge drops like we did we wanted to see huge decreases when inflation was up in, in the eight and nine percent range but now we want to see small continued decreases in inflation and that would enable and, and empower the federal reserve to cut rates in which a lot of people think it's going to the first one's going to come in march now here, I think, is the underlying story that's kind of good news is everyone agrees that the Federal Reserve is going to start cutting rates in 2024. I haven't found anyone that thought uh, opposite unless they were just trying to – unless it was clickbait. But it's not really a debate of if they will cut rates in 2024. It's when they will cut rates in 2024. Most think it's going to be – the first one will be in March, and it will be at a quarter percent. And the remaining of those things is going to be May, and that will be a quarter of a percent. But the underlying story there is that they're going to cut rates. So what lift that provides for our markets, it's there. It's just a matter of when. That's what we've been saying all along since 2022. We know what made the markets fall in 22. We know what made the markets fall in the third quarter of 23. It's the same thing that made it go up. It was just the opposite information. Now that we know that, that what the Federal Reserve is doing is working, we just that we, hopefully it doesn't work too much and we start having these recession fears. And that will be the end, the, the final grade for the Federal Reserve. I know Rob is not a fan of, but the final nope. grade for the Federal Reserve will be that we get inflation down to where it needs to be. And if we go into a recession, of course, if we don't go into a recession, they get a resounding A+. plus. But if we go into a recession, how long does that recession last, and do they have the capability by moving the interest rates to pull us out of that recession? And that's why, you know, even in 22, when, when rates can, in 23, when rates continue to go up, I was like, in a way, the higher the rates go, the more, the more likely we won't go into a recession because that's just ammunition for rate cutting to keep us out of a recession. So they're walking that tightrope and to this point have done a pretty good job. John, <clears throat> it makes me a little bit crazy. This is an election year and, you know, the hyperbole is going to flow and the, the politicians in Washington are going to take a victory lap that they finally they tamed inflation. Sure, they ran it up to almost 10 percent, you know, nine and change in, in the middle of the year. What what gets lost in all of this is the fact that we are paying somewhere between 17 and 22 percent more for everything 
than before this started. That genie can't be put back in the bottle, right? So the inflation, all inflation has to start, stop sooner or later. It's like a fire. You know, the Chicago fire went out because it ran out of fuel. Inflation will ultimately stop because people can no longer afford things. Um, is, is there, are there political victory laps to be taken out of this? There, there will be, but I don't think it's justified either in blaming politically, blaming the not completely justified anyway. Uh, there's, there's things that politically that happened that either helped with or slowed inflation down. But the ultimate guide to this inflation narrative, which what, what, what caused the inflation, the main factor that what caused the inflation was the Federal Reserve cutting rates way back in 2020. That is the main factor. Now, of course, we had some of the easy money policies, and we had the PPP. Those all contributed to inflation. Every bit of it contributed to inflation. However, the main factor of it was the rate cutting and the easy money uh, that the Federal Reserve provided. Now, what is bringing slowing inflation down is the exact same thing, just the opposite. The Federal Reserve increased rates to slow our economy down, which helped provide the, uh, the backdrop to inflation falling. And the reason I say it's not really a, pol a political uh, where you could throw a dart and say, yep, this is what happened politically is because the Federal Reserve is not supposed to be political. You have to remember who appointed Jerome Powell, and that was, that was Donald Trump uh, who appointed Jerome Powell. So I think it would be disingenuous for the sitting administration to say, hey, look what we did, how we brought inflation down when it was the Federal Reserve that, bought, that has brought inflation down. And, and, but in the same token – to, b to blame administration. Now, I do think there's, there were a lot of administrative decisions that contributed to the already burning fire, but that fire was already burning. So I don't know that I would necessarily justify pointing to either party and saying, hey, you caused this inflation or you brought this inflation down, because I think that the onus of that lies on the Federal Reserve. They caused the inflation by cutting rates back in COVID. They, the Federal Reserve caused the inflation to really pop because they misread the transitory tone. And, again, I understand how they misread that transitory tone because of the current environment. How do you read, how do you compare things to, to April, May, June, July 2020? And then they got delayed by, by certain things, other strands of COVID, and Russia and Ukraine delayed their increases in rates so that once they began – they had to do it sharply. They had to be very, very sharp with those increases. And they continued on through that through uh, uh, mo all of 22 and a big part of 23. So I don't know that I would justify them taking credit for bringing inflation down at all. But, but make no mistake about it. They absolutely will take credit for inflation coming <laughs> down uh, when it comes, uh, when it comes uh, voting time. Maddie. And I'm just laughing. I, I, you, yeah, they're going to take credit. Of course, and what most, they do. <laughs> most people won't think about the Federal Reserve, right? I mean, most people will go, uh, yeah, that's uh, right. It, it, it did come down, and this person's responsible when really they had nothing to do with it. Phil, take, take me back to your very first statement when Rob asked about, hey, 2023. And you said 2023 was great. Going through 2023, it seemed like all we heard was negative things. Was was it a matter of getting too caught in the details maybe and not seeing the full picture until the end of the year, and then you can look back and go, that wasn't as bad as we thought? Well, a couple things. One, when I say it was great, I mean in terms of the stock market uh, performance was great, but we do have a human behavior, and you, and you learn a lot about this when you get the, your CFP and all the all the designations that we have. But human behavior is we remember the down markets. We don't remember the positive markets. And, and everybody has a story about 08, 09. People will have a story about the five weeks in 2020. But the, the overall narrative about 2020, if, if you go back and ask most people, it's like, hey, what your, what's your, uh, your portfolio do in 2020? I bet you most of them will say, man, it was terrible. COVID, COVID killed me in, in, the, in the early year. But at the end of the day, if you stayed put, 2020 was a very good year for the stock market. Believe it or not, it was a good year for the stock market. So we internalize loss much more than what we do gain. We remember those losses more than we than we do the good years. And, and it, I think that rings true in a lot of things. You know, when I think back on my 
my little football career, I remember all the losses. I remember very few of the wins, but I remember all of the losses. I could sit down with my buddies and we can go through each and every loss, the score, probably our stats, what we did wrong, the penalties that we had. I couldn't tell you much about uh, other than the last game that we played at Shepherd. I couldn't tell you much about the wins. I couldn't tell you much at all about the wins. But I, I remember all of the losses, and that's the same thing when we go to judge our portfolios. People will get phone calls occasionally when people get their paper statements. It's what most people in our practice anyway. It's when most people take a glance at their portfolio. If it's been a really bad month and they get a, they'll get their statement, say, on the 10th or 11th for the previous month, we may get a phone call. We may get a remark if someone's calling for something that's been a bit. Our, our portfolios are down. We rarely, if ever, get a phone call to tell us about how great the, that the month has been. And, and that should be the, the reaction that we get from December statements, there's going to be some pop in people's portfolios that they may not have expected simply because of how good December was as a month. So market-wise, I think 2023 was a really good year. Economy-wise, and I'm, I'm, and I'm talking with, without my financial fill hat on here because I go into the grocery stores and, and do the same things everybody else does, it didn't feel so good. Because like John had mentioned a little bit ago, everything is more expensive than what I'm accustomed to and what I'm used to. And, and that really hasn't gone down. And, and, and I don't know that it will, especially at the grocery stores. I don't know that it ever will. But the stock market performance was really good. And, you know, a, a story left untold, and it probably will remain that way. The bond market in the fourth quarter of 2023 also had a pop, and that was something that failed us in 2022. But the bond market, and it is a, br- a bright future for the br- bond market in terms of how bonds would go up and down, simply because we should remain in a in- decreasing interest rate environment, and that's good for existing bonds. It makes your existing bonds, and, and those are, are the ones in your portfolio, worth more value as long as we remain in that in that uh, environment where we're in a decreasing or anticipated decreasing rate environment. Yeah, you go to the supermarket, Phil, to get your Cocoa Puffs or Fruity Pebbles. It's like $6.19 a box now. It, it is more expensive for everything, yes. And, and as, a, as a consumer, I have felt that. Uh, most people have. But on when I, put my, when I put my blinds on and look at portfolio performance, 23 was a good year. Bill, you prefer the Fruity Pebble or the Cocoa Puff? Um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, how do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Have a great day, Philip. Thank you, guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Catch Happy Phil's two-minute reports each morning at uh, 638, replayed at 738.